I'm Randy Reed, Executive Director of the National Lighting Bureau, and we're here for the eighth annual Lighting Forum. I'm joined by David Warfel of Light Can Help You, Megan Carroll of Illuminations Incorporated New York, as well as the IES NYC president, and Deborah Burnett of the Benya Burnett Consultancy. The name of this panel is titled IES, the Second Language of Light, and panelists, welcome. Thank you. David, the, the first question is for you, and it's kind of an obvious question. If this is titled a second language of light, what was the first language of light? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I think there might be two. And the first one is, uh, let's see, I need an LED with a CRI of 95 uh, plus with an R9 of 80 plus and a CCT of 3000K and a CBCP of 10. You get where I'm going, right? We have a technical language of lighting that is um, that people can people outside of our industry have no idea what we're talking about, and I think that's the first language of of, of light that we use to communicate the important things that we need to know. Um, there might be a second one already, and that second one is uh, you know, and I'm guilty of using both of these. You know, we talk about light as the foundation of the universe, the beauty in a sunrise over the ocean, the romance of a candle at dinner, um, which is all true. But it doesn't really communicate anything to uh, to us in terms of what we need to do in terms of action and and where we need to go with light. So I, I feel like we have this overly technical language and this beautiful poetic language, and there's nothing in between that we can actually use. But I, I would like to add in that um, I think the the second example is how we need to talk to consumers because that's what they identify with. That's what they can grasp. Our community is an echo chamber and we need to get out beyond that echo chamber and not, not talk about the health benefits yet, not talk about anything but how it can help your home feel larger at night when you, you push back the night with good exterior lighting, how better lighting can help your kids study uh, and be more productive and how you might really cut the tomatoes instead of your finger when you're in the kitchen. So it's a little bit of both. But Megan, you're saying more of an emotional discussion rather than a technical discussion. Is that right? Yes, for consumers, yes. And if, and if that's who we're talking about here, making lighting accessible and important to consumers, we need to change the language entirely. I look at it from a language skill of three different disciplines. The discipline of physics, physiology and cognition. And I believe that all three of those languages need to be incorporated into how we speak and apply and study light and lighting. Because if not, we're missing. We're missing the consumer understanding of light. We're missing the medical and the physiology aspect of light. And we're more importantly missing the technical reason for illuminating engineering. Um, so let me explain a little bit about why I, I, I have selected those three languages, which, by the way, I've been practicing going back to the 70s in the way that I do design and architecture, construction and lighting. And I look at it from the physics perspective. Physics is a science and a study that defines the properties in chemistry of the interactions of time, space, matter and energy from IES. It's the influence of the appearance of space. It's the visual, the appearance of space and how all of those other elements interact within that space. Architects also practice through the physics. From the physiological perspective, that's the chemistry and the physics. It's the study of that as it is applied to the biological activities of living matter. It's anatomy and biology, medicine, pharmacology, circadian, visual, immune system, and only a teen tiny bit is being explained or studied or even explored from the IES and lighting industries. And that's the visual system circadian relevance. They fail to understand that the circadian system is the entire body, the entire complexity of a living organism. And we don't communicate that effectively. And the third is cognition. And this is something that speaks to what Megan is, is, is espousing in, in terms of speaking to consumers and what David has done on some of his um, presentations. 
And cognition, when we think of cognition, we think, oh yeah, well, that's how I think. Well, it's more than that. It's the process, thinking, identifying, and understanding information. And we do that depending upon where we fall on the, the psychological evaluation charts. It's either five or eight different elements. And I like to use the six elements of attention, perception, memory, learning, reasoning, and justifying. And when we apply all three, physics, the language of physiology and the language of cognition, we really understand how to speak and teach and educate and apply lighting. And that's especially important when we're dealing with my area of expertise, which is sleep and sleep medicine and circadian relevance, immune function, and how light impacts the living organism, whether it be human, fungi, bacteria, muscle, eelgrass, zooplankton, whatever it may be. First, I just wanted for our audience, clarify the difference between physics and physiology. Physics is the study of the scientific understanding that defines the properties of chemistry and interactions of time, energy, space, and matter. It's more mathematical based and it's understanding relationships. Physiology is the study of the chemistry and physics as it's applied so physics is defining and physiology is applied. That's okay. the basis. So David, I'm coming back to you, kind of to our original question. Why do we even need a second language of light? Uh, because there are consumers and there are clients and there are homeowners who have this much bandwidth to learn about light. And yet they're affected by it every moment of every day. And, you know, I think... Um, I, I kind of don't want to follow up Deborah because she's way smarter than I am. Um, and like, I've got to learn, I want to learn from you. I'm trying to take notes here while, while you're talking. There's so much about light. It's, I mean, it's a lifelong passion for, you know, all of us <laughs> here, right? This is, this is something that we've spent our, our adult lives chasing and learning. And yet somebody building a house, for example, and I, I work in now, uh, moved from the commercial sector into the residential sector, somebody moving from a house, you know, in, in a rest, somebody building a house, most of the time their lighting choice, they make one choice and it's bronze or satin nickel. Mm -hmm. And that is the only moment that they interface with light, period. And so we we can't you know i've struggled for years to try and educate the client right to try and give them enough knowledge to make informed decisions but when they, we're going from you know bronze or satin nickel to all of these different you know the 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 physics and the physiology and the cognition which ember just said you know okay great that's all stuff that informs needs to inform the lighting decisions but right now are the people uh, you know the the average person out there, they don't have the bandwidth to learn it. Mm -hmm. They need like a simple, stuff. easy way in. And unfortunately, the simple, easy way in right now is like, oh, CRI of 95, I'm good, right? And which is like, I don't even care, <laughs> you know, at some point in, in, in design, what, you know. Megan? It's, it's as confusing in some respects as going into Home Depot to buy a light bulb. Mm -hmm. It's intimidating. It's overwhelming. Um, they all look the same, but my dad took the cheapest one and it was uh, a, um, a circular T5 and it was so blue and my dad had dementia. Um, and in his later years, I would come home to Wisconsin, um, the big lighting capital of the world from New York City to Wisconsin, and my dad would be sitting under this terribly blue fluorescent light and at sundown, dementia patients often experience sundown syndrome enhanced by or exacerbated by mm -hmm. terrible light. And it was so hard for me to explain to my mom and dad why this wasn't a good choice. And so we need to make the language um, accessible and the benefits accessible to, the, to people who live with light every day but don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I wanna comment on that. In that when we understand as a profession, the physics and physiology, 
then we're able to take that and distill it down very effectively. Um, I'm in Jim's office, so it's kind of hard for me to, to replicate this, but I want to use my arm. A number of people have seen this demonstration, and this gives a demonstration of something that's completely foreign to most people, and it's solved so much of our problems of Alzheimer's and dementia is what you were speaking, Megan, and the lighting aspect of what most people in their homes, because, you know, for 15 years, I was a licensed building contractor and I did mostly resis. And it was like, well, I just want my home to be light and fresh and airy and to make sure that I can get up in the middle of the night to pee. I mean, that, that, that's what they were talking about. That's the type of light they want. So, but when you understand it very specifically, you're able to speak very common language and know that what you're talking about is correct. So I'm going to use my arm. This is a chromatin of DNA. DNA is A, T, C's, and G's, the little squiggly lines you see on the, like the CSI television shows, you know, the, the crime scenes, you know, in our DNA. Here's my bracelets, the A, T, C's, and G's. Over top of this in our body, throughout all of the, the, the billions of genes that we have in the cells that we have, there is a sleeve, a chromatin sleeve, and there's a marker on top of this sleeve. It's called an epigenetic marker. And when this marker gets the right signal from the environment, heat and light and the timing and the sequence of that heat and light and the directionality of that light, this marker is going to go, oh, okay, I'm going to pull up this sleeve because I got the right signal. And some of these genes are going to turn on and off. 51% of our genes are regulatory genes, and they depend on signals from the environment. And the main signal that we have is light and temperature. And architects, designers, and lighting designers control the light and the temperature. And that's where we need to teach. But in order to teach, we have to know the science. So in your example, if I may, uh -huh. turning these genes on and off, which right. you're using as bracelets, uh -huh. do they care if it's electric light or natural light? It all depends on, no, no, it does not. And that's where we are right now with the field of LED lighting. We're able to replicate the majority of the lighting that is required, not all of it, because UV, um, uh, UVA, BC, NIR, and IR are very intricately part of our entire circadian system. But for the visual circadian system, we need to understand that it's the directionality of that light that's going to impact these bracelets, the timing of light, and the duration of that light. And then finally, the spectral power distribution of that light. And unfortunately, the language that IES and a number of other bodies are using is strictly on the physics side. And it's not understanding completely the physiological side or the cognition side, as what David and Megan are speaking about, which is how to communicate this very difficult stuff to couch potatoes. So, and that's what we all are when it comes to areas outside our preview. Okay, so David, I, I, I'm coming back to you and I'm gonna to try to really put you on the spot here. You say we need a second language of light and we talk about the engineering part and we talk about the poetic part. Mm -hmm. So specifically, what are you suggesting? It has to be motivi motivated by why. I think that's what it really comes down to, Randy, is that, um, you know, to communicate, to get the average person to say, I'm going to pay a little bit more attention, or I'm going to do uh, something that's a little different than four cans and a fan. I'm going to think about light, or I'm going to let somebody think about light for me, and I'm going to pay them to do that, right? Those are the options. You're either going to figure it out yourself, or you're going to you know, get someone who does. To get that person across that line, they have to understand why light is important. And we talk about what light does day in and day out. And we talk about you know, the effects on our biology, you know, we talk about color tuning, we talk about needing task, ambient, accent, light. And those are like three, you know, I've, I used to use them every day. And now I think they're three of the most boring terms in the world. Like, it doesn't tell us why it tells us what, 
you need this light at this time, you need that light at this time, you need this light for that. And we don't make decisions that way. We make decisions based on uh, emotion, sort of why is it important to us? Why is it important to us? So as I say, you know, what we've been using with our clients is uh, we got rid of task ambient and accent light. And we said, you need light for these five things. What are they? We need, you need light to see what you're doing so you can do it better. That's task light, right? But it's a different way of talking about it. And it may not, and it may not be what we have in our head as task light, because when you say we need light to see what we're doing, what are you doing, right? You have to figure that out. Light to see, um, uh, light to know where you are and where you're going. Light to feel better, to feel good, to feel alert in the morning, to feel relaxed in the evening. You need light that helps you do that, right? Um, the fourth one that we use is we. You need light to help you focus on whatever it is that you're supposed to be focusing on or you want to be focusing on. And then the fifth one is light can help us adapt to changes more easily. So, you know, we just, we, we stop talking about that when we talk about layers of light and we talk about how is it that light can help you? Like, why do you need light? You need it so that it can help you do these five things. And there's nothing magic about those five terms. They're, 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 you know, they're just something that we use. There's, I'm sure there's better language out there to be discovered as a group. Um, but it completely transformed our client conversations mm -hmm. completely. Uh, and we get so much more. Yes. Okay. We'll try that, which is really what we're asking them to do is take a huge leap of faith because what we do is so different than what everybody else does. And what we do costs so much more oftentimes than what everybody else does, that it's a huge leap of faith for them. And the, you know, we have to, we have to use a different language to get there. And then in the end, when they call and they say, okay, I wasn't so sure about this, but wow, I love my house, <laughs> right? You know, We'll get more people, you know, that'll gather steam when there are more people doing that. But at the moment, we got to get people off the couch. We got to get them over the hump. Yeah. I, I support fully the IES's efforts to educate its membership. Mm -hmm. um, that's what their goal is. That's what the, they, they do. They are the lighting authority. Um, and they are backed up by understanding the physiology and the cognition. But that's not what gets articulated down through the layers um, we need to engage with utilities around the country so that it's no longer what the ESCO can find that's cheapest and available. It's what's right for the application. Um, and I think ESCOs um, were very beneficial, but they, they also did a lot of damage in replacing incandescents with uh, CFLs or, or or first generation LEDs. And today we need to correct a lot of those mistakes. And again, engage with ESCOs. Um, I think the National Lighting Bureau is, is, is stepping up and making an effort to engage the audience. But um, we need to, to reach out to uh, end users, consumers, people who will benefit. St stop talking here to the echo chamber and, and get out to, to people who really don't know what they're missing. Mm -hmm. Before I go to Deb, I just want to point out one thing. But when you say ESCOs, it really was the utilities, was it not? Because the utilities right. were driving the ESCOs because right. of the rates and the energy. Right, right. And that, that's still certain, but you, you, can, you can have it all. And sometimes you have to sacrifice a bit of R9, uh, but you can still have, you can still live with an 80, but there's no need, need to live with a 70 or less CRI, unless um, it might be a sports stadium. No, and even then, no I need. there's no need. Thank you. Not in, not in today's, with today's technology, I think there's no need. Right. Deborah. Yeah, um, I want to agree and just slightly modify a little bit about what Megan was speaking about in that the retrofitters had a huge impact on the general perception of what LEDs can and cannot do. And they were responsible for fomenting so much of the inconsistencies and inaccuracies about wellness lighting, about the benefits of lighting. I can remember being called in 2008 and 2009 um, from a very distraught behavior behavioral um, analyst with the human resource department of a major insurance company because a retrofitter was had the ear of the CEO and they were promoting 8,000 CCT in all of the call centers. Brand new, you know, cutting edge technology, 8,000 CCT, because this was the understanding of IS and CIE at the time, 8,000 the higher, and how we ended up with 4,000 CCT being standardized for roadway. And so 
the part that I just want to modify, Megan, on your approach is that IES understands the physiology and the physics of the visual system and light on the visual system alone. They fail to realize that light is a neuroendocrine uh, stimulator. It is a bioendocrine uh, stimulator, and it could be a disruptive factor for all of our biologies. And so unless we as an organization, IES and all of the other um, organizing bodies, the 10 bodies that support ANSI and the codification, we need to understand it from that medical and anatomical and biology and medicine and pharmacology perspective, because light is a stimulus and it's more than just visual at this point. And what David's saying is understanding and delivering it to the basis of our clients. For me, I explain it. Hey, do you want to get a good night's sleep? Do you want to see your waistline stay the same? Do you want to have your kids happy in the morning? This is what we need to do. Megan? I, I, um, I appreciate your, your insights, uh, Deborah. And, and it's, it, this is a good example of all the scientists that um, the industry works with and, and with the IES particularly, whether it's uh, Bud Brainerd from Thomas Jefferson or uh, Stephen Lockley from Brigham uh, and Women's in Boston or Mariana Figueroa. They are all um, our educators. Uh, we rely on them. They serve our committees um, to set standards and to assess the best application. But even they can't agree because research, depending on how it's done, delivers different results. And so that's part of the problem. But I think the first thing is um, consumers should make every effort to educate themselves and don't believe the first thing you hear or read or see reach out more, question more, uh, deep dive uh, onto the uh, various search tools that are out there um, and just do your homework a little bit more. And, and David, let me ask you again, I, I love to ask you about the language here. Should it be standardized? Should we, I, I don't know who, but should the industry try to standardize this new language? Well, that's a good question, Randy. I mean, we can't even standardize uh, the one we have now, I think, I mean, there's, there obviously are, are, there are efforts. Um, I, let me put it this way. If a lot of people in the industry and a lot of members and, you know, organizations in the industry came together and said, I think we're going to talk about light this way, it would be a step in the right direction. Now, I would not want any organization to own that and to regulate it, you know, because, you know, as, as we've discovered here, just in this conversation, what we know today about light is completely different than what we knew 20 years ago, um, and even two years ago, right? Like as we, as the research continues to come out, we learn more and more all the time. Um, and I think a fixed language of light might be dangerous, but I do think that organizations like the IAS and um, you know could and the NLB could take a look at language and say, okay how are we really going to talk to people? What is the most effective way to communicate with the average citizen <laughs> to help them make good decisions about light? And I do think we could come together and unify and create, you know, kind of a standard. And if we all banded together, we could change the way lighting works. It's sort of like lighting is a mess right now as an industry, in my humble opinion. Um, and because it's been commodified, right? It's been turned, you know, light is just as important to the house as natural gas. Actually, it's way more important, right? But it's been treated like a utility that has to be delivered for as low a cost as possible. And that's it, right? Um, and you just, you know, just like water, I guess you choose your, your, your bronze or satin nickel, right? It's the same choice for lighting as it is for plumbing, but it has a completely different effect on our, on our, our lives and well-being. We have to change that. We have to change it across the board. Like everyone has to start moving in a new direction if we're going to bring the public along with this. Okay. And, and for those audience members listening at home or watching at home, I'd, I'd also like to point out there's several other organizations out there that can help you learn more. For example, the Designers Lighting Forum, which exists in LA, Boston, and New York, DLF. Um, there's also uh, IALD, the International Association of Lighting Designers, and this is an organization for professional practitioners. 
And then the IES, which is uh, an open organization. Uh, anyone of any desire can join us. Um, but our industry makes it so difficult for the end user to get a solution. And this is going to take us down a whole nother rabbit hole because we've got the specifier, we've got the distributor, we've got the owner's rep, we've got the broker, we've got the ECs in there, we've got the GCs in there, everybody's adding on a 10 and 15%. And by the time we're done, the project is, has swelled three or four times the initial budget. Mm -hmm. So that's another broken part of our industry. Okay, so if I may, maybe first of all, channel stack, you're right. Total different subject, we're not gonna solve it here. You listed a few organizations, we will just respectfully add the NLB to it. And Thank you. Yeah. And ALA, I think the ALA is doing a tremendous yes, yes. job of, of education. And then you talked about, if I may, Lockley, Brainerd, and Figaro don't necessarily all agree. The researchers don't. But my point is, I look at all of them, and I think they're maybe 80% in agreement. And they all believe in uh, brighter days and darker nights for the most part. So that's why I think it is time to go ahead and get started. Let's not, quote, wait until the science is totally settled, because that may be another 10 or 20 years. And I think we can do some good by starting now. Deborah. Yeah. OK, I want to use my three areas of language very quickly, very quickly to define the topic of health and light. From a physics perspective, light is part of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. It has different colors. Each color has a different number assigned to it. It's called wavelengths. From a physiological perspective, light gets in. It goes in about this far back to a special area of the brain. That then goes to an area right about here, right above our uh, cervical area, right below our cervical area, up top right here where the top of my jacket comes. And it also goes to an area called the PVN, it goes all the way down to the base of the spine. All of those different spaces that the light goes stays for a specific period of time. It's light that's going to turn it on or off, and it's going to increase your ability for the chemicals to get you up in the morning, the uh, um, cholesterol, uh, the uh, uh, cortisol, as well as your testosterone, your serotonin and tryptophan. And at night, it's going to go right back up again to a back portion of your brain, to the area right in front of where we, we see our visual cortex. And that's going to allow you to sleep. From a cognition point of view, I'd like to say to the general consumers, hey, this is it. You get bright light in the morning without sunglasses, without your contact lenses before 9.30 or 10 in the morning. You try to get some exercise so that you're outside. You wake up with your blinds open. If you have electric uh, curtains, you open them up about 4.15 in the morning, no matter where you are in the upper hemisphere, the northern hemisphere. And then you start taking your temperature in your house a little bit warmer in the afternoon and you keep it warm throughout until about eight or nine o'clock. You stop eating your meals about eight o'clock at night. You turn off all of your overhead lights and you use just reading lamps, small little book lights or accent lights on your art, on your art pieces. And then you turn your fireplace off, your heat off and you turn your temperature down cold. You jump in the shower at night make the shower hit that superior cervical nerve right there and jump into a cold bed, wham, you're asleep. It's gonna help you process all the calories you ate during the day. You're gonna keep your weight down and you're gonna get up because at four o'clock in the morning, you may be sound asleep, but your eyelids are only 0.8 millimeters. They're gonna know that light is changing outside and it's gonna start something called a cortisol awakening response. In other words, your body's gonna be awake and you're gonna get up about six o'clock and you're gonna go, I had a great night's sleep. So you're suggesting I don't watch my 84 inch television right before I go to bed? Hell no, so sorry, hell no. <laughs> okay. David, closing comments. I, you know, I think that we've heard a lot today and uh, I've learned a lot today. And when I come back to like who my client is and my client is just a homeowner, um, how do we talk to them about light it has to be simplified. It has to be so much shorter and so much less than what we've discussed just in this short mm -hmm. webinar. It has to, you know, it has to get them, you know, right away. We need to find something, uh, a, a way that says you want a sunny day and you want a starry night. Those are the two things you need or whatever it is. Right. And then as the industry moves together in one direction, uh, 
if we're moving in that new direction and we're talking about light in a whole new way, we will bring the public along with us and we will bring every stakeholder in the industry along with us because it is better on the other side. We know that, we know the science, we know all of that, but we've got to just kind of figure out that way to say, come on, try this. Megan, closing comment? I I think this has been a really good discussion because we three represent very different ways of seeing the spectrum. Uh, Deborah's over here in her spectrum, uh, looking at uh, the physics, the physiology and cognition. David is more practical application and I'm trying to marry the two in the middle. Mm -hmm. So can we come back to this next month, Brandy? Oh yeah, that'd be great. No, I like that idea. Yeah. I like that idea. Okay, closing comments, Deborah. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to make a difference. And if nothing else, to share unique thoughts on something that that a lot of people have thought, well, maybe we're ready to go ahead and start solidifying groundworks, rules, and and and, and prescriptions to follow. But maybe we're not, but maybe we are. We don't know. And maybe this group can brainstorm, kick the can, figure out what we do and do not know. And maybe a few folks will learn a little bit and maybe we'll learn a little bit along the way. So, well, thank you all. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. We are now live and I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I hope you could see the passion from the panelists and we're going to take a few questions now. But before we do, I just want to remind everyone that next Monday, the NLB is hosting its uh, light Let's talk about light and health series. This one has Dr. Sophia Axelrod, and she's talking about a new kind of lullaby, robust light, dark patterns for babies. And I think you will find that fascinating. That will be Monday at noon Eastern. You can sign up at, or get the details at the Edison Report. Okay, let's take the uh, first question. Now, we've got uh, Rebecca Manning. Rebecca has asked about power imbalance. The shareholder costs have more value than the human cost. As Megan said, so complicated to do anything. We need a Helen Keller and Sullivan moment. Very good. Um, Megan, you want to comment on that? I agree completely. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's changing the language for the right audience. It's reading the room. It's understanding what's the project, what's the budget. And what, what's the goal of the whole process? What, what, do we need, what do you want to light? You can't highlight everything because then everything's going to be blinding. So pick and choose your moments. What do you want to create? What do you want to experience? So the end user uh, and the building owner have a responsibility to know what they want to do. It's, don't, don't shut it all back to the professionals. Have a vested in, interest in it. Be your own lighting advocate. Okay. Uh can I chime in there? I think, you know, Rebecca, you've kind of hit the nail on the head and in that lighting is a product, but light is something way more. And unfortunately, much of what we put our money and our energy and our time into is the product side of lighting. We have to have product. We have to have good product, but it is seen as the end result, you know, as the goal of so much of the money and investment and time and energy and lighting is a product, but that, you know, can cause as many problems as it solves if that's the end of the conversation. But light in, its, in and of itself, you know, that's why we need another language because right now all of our language is wrapped up in product. It's not wrapped up in what, you know, I, the flowery stuff, like I like to say the gift of light, like gift is, I mean, light is magic. I mean, it's phenomenal. Uh, and what we're more concerned with as an industry is you know the margin on a on a shipping container and and at that point you know yes we need to make profits we need to be profitable we need to put food on the table but at some point we do need that you know the helen keller annie sullivan moment to say hold on a second we need to think about this in an entirely different way than we're doing right now and how do we educate non-professional designers on design when it's nearly impossible to get most of the design groups to engage. There are designers in the EC distributor and AE firms that are very talented designers, but they only get input and training on the science, not the design and application. It's a great question. Who wants to take that one? 
I'll take that. Uh, uh, we we referenced before some of the associations that are accessible to anyone who has any interest, whether it's the American Lighting Association or NLB or Designers Lighting Forum of New York, and go to your local independent bookseller, go to the self-help center, find home design uh, books. You will find Gary Gordon's wonderful book. You'll find Chip Israel's book. You'll find uh, books on, at a very high level and at a very basic level. And um, hopefully this message is reaching the right people and David, Warfell, the lighting evangelist, uh, is having viral marketing uh, sensations happening around him. Uh, and Deborah, with her science and approach, um, you just have to do research, look around, Google search it. There, it. We're out there. IES, Illuminating Engineering Society. I wish we could change our name because we're a lot more than that. Um, th there's a couple of ideas. Yeah. Deborah, do you want to chime in? Uh, yeah. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said so far. And and the thing that, that I see that we're lacking is our voice, our ability, in, particularly in architectural projects and the architectural process itself. Lighting design usually comes in on the tail end of the project. We very rarely, very, you know, it's a blue moon, literally, if we're involved with the, um, the, the, the planning stages, the initiate, the programming stages of any type of a commercial project. And we very rarely have the opportunity to ask the questions that David is, is posing or, or what I had used and, and Megan is speaking about, you know, especially if we're reading the books and we understand it, but, but we're hampered where our hands are tied because we, co we come into the project so far down that a lot of the well, what do you want light to do? What type of things do you want to do under this light or with or without the light has already been addressed. And, and then we have the added burden of the VE process at the end of the project. We spent all this time specifying and collecting product and you know getting all of the distributors, the sales reps, everybody in line, the purchasing agent, and then, VE comes in and it goes immediately to the contractor who was always going to say, I can get it cheaper for you and Good substitutes. And, and it's really difficult. Even if we write our contracts to where we have that ability to, to object, it seems to get forgotten. And we have to keep reminding our clients and reminding the architect and reminding the hierarchy of the project. So I think if we use our voice, we use our voice in writing editorials and making um, it known to those architects that we regularly do projects with, that, hey, we really want to be part of a charrette. We want to work on a charrette and provide that for you so that everybody on the team, whether it be the contractor, the the purchasing agent of the company, the client itself, the client's families sometimes really are involved, particularly if it's law firms or dental or doctor's offices. You know, we get everyone involved so everyone knows the importance of light. And I, I think that's really going to be a big help. And that's where the languages, the three languages I spoke about and what David and Megan and Randy, you and I and had many discussions over, that's where we get a chance to use that second language of light because it comes from here. And right. that's where we do our best self. Brianne's question. Thank you all. I learned uh, some things today too. In terms of language, what's the biggest hiccup in communicating about color use? Parentheses, color change, think RGB, subtle and otherwise. I have an answer to that. I think it's Las Vegas. I think that's the biggest hiccup to color. Uh, talking about color with with ordinary clients and ordinary people is that, you know, the first LEDs that really hit the market were RGB, which meant they could do everything but white. So in some places they did everything but white, you know, and, and color has this kind of cheesy, um, overly dramatic, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, Hey, I don't need color. That's sort of the the answer, you know, that most of the sort of more practical thinking clients will give us. And 
you know, the truth is when you look at light, like, you know, if you imagine a world where everything is just white light, it's really a terrible world. It's a cloudy day. And I don't want to live under a cloudy day all the time. So, you know, what we've tried to do is say, forget all the color changing stuff and think about from sunrise to sunset, look at the sky, what happens over the course of 24 hours of day. Now let's show you that same reel in black and white. And it's like, oh, I hate that now. You know, no one drives to the pier to watch a black and white sunset. Nobody does. When we put it back in terms of like saying, no, 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 we're not trying to give you something extra, something cool and fancy and trendy. We're trying to restore something that our industry took away when we forced you to live under fixed CCT lighting. And for me, that's sort of what's been opening up the conversation in lighting. It's not about adding something. It's about giving it back because we took it away. Nathaniel, do you have a question? I, I do. Am I coming through here? Yes, yeah. you are. Yes. Yay. Um, really appreciate this conversation. This is something uh, <clears throat> near and dear to my heart. I, I think my question is, um, I feel like we're talking about potentially two different audiences. Uh, when we say consumer, um, there's sort of the commercial side and in the project and the architect and obviously end user. Um, but then in residential, it's a very different consumer. Um, and I think both of those segments of the industry have different levels of understanding. Um, and personally, I would say that there's a, a fairly good representation of the commercial side. Um, I, uh, as a residential lighting designer, am really passionate about the residential side. And so my question is, is how do we, is it worth spending energy and effort and time trying to get in front of those people or is it just too difficult? Um, and do we just need to kind of keep working on the commercial side? Kind of what are some thoughts and, and ways to get people who can talk this second language of light mm -hmm. in front of the people who are, again, I would say um, homeowner consumers, people who are, have maybe great lighting in their work office and then go home to horrible lighting. Hey, let's Thank go you. to Megan first on this one. Megan, go ahead. I think um, that the, the residential market, home consumption prices have gone through the roof. Um, there's a lot more opportunity for us to continue to educate. And the, 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 unfortunately, education costs money. We used to use print magazines. Remember print magazines to teach and to show the before and afters of experiences and, and those are kind of gone. So we need to get the talking points at Home Depot or Lowe's or renovation hardware. We need to continue to educate mm -hmm. at using the right language. Um, talk about where do you wanna have a cup of coffee? Um, Starbucks or do you wanna to go to McDonald's? Where are you gonna feel better emotionally? And why do you think that is? You have to give them something to relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, speaking back with what Nathan, Nathan's questions, and, and then also this, this current question, um, you know, has to do with how we define color. You know, when, when a lighting designer, we're asked about color, we automatically think, oh, CCT, you know, we're thinking about it in color. But when a consumer, a general homeowner asked about color, they're asking about how is this light going to affect the color of the paint that they just put on the wall? How are they going to, you know, look at their children differently across the dinner table underneath the new uh, chandelier that they have? And, and I think that's where, when we're speaking to consumers, we need to ask some very specific questions. And, and I found out years and years ago, I'm a, a chairholder of the color marketing group and we speak specific color, you know, and so we can forecast colors coming down the line. And, and I got into the habit of training my, my residential clients of saying, when you're speaking and asking for specific color, say three words to define that color, a blue based green with a tint of uh, amber you know, in order to describe your paint color. And then you're going to start getting an idea of what they see color as. So then you can then recommend the type of lighting CCT that's going to best facilitate what they see. Because everyone understands and sees, quote unquote, sees color differently. And color, David, you had said going down to the end of the pier to see the sunset. Well, what are you looking at? You're not looking specifically at the sun going down in that flash of green if you're lucky as it hits the water. 
it's the colors. It's the colors. It's the ambiance. It's the changing sea levels and the color of the sky. And people go, oh, look at the blue. Look at the turquoise. Look at that pink. Oh, my God. You know, and that's what they're saying. So if we're just talking about the color of light, we're missing the boat. It's what the light does to the colors around us. And that's where we as an industry can really help our com consumer clients. And Megan, your thought about educating Home Depot and Lowe's and everything else with their displays, I am right for that because they do a terrible job. And at the beginning, during our actual presentation that we did, uh, pre-taped, um, your dad going in and going, what kind of light do I get? I mean, it's even now more, you know, confusing. So, yeah, we, however, as an industry overall, we need to do a lot better. And um, fortunately, we have people that are interested. So that's great. Yeah. Can I pop in there? Yeah. Um, just to answer, you know, give Nathaniel another answer. I think, you know, in that residential level, um, you know, one of the earlier questions was, how do we learn about light? And I think the best residential lighting book is 20 years old. It's called The Not So Big House, and it's not about lighting, but it gets people to start thinking about home design in a different way. And light is included in that in Sarah Suzanka's series. But um, when really, how are we going to have this conversation? You think about who influences the homeowners. Um, this is, I don't think that we're going to have very much success with a top down education program. I think that if we want to make sea change in the industry and sea change in the public mind, um, we have to have a lighting version of Chip and Joanna Gaines. Like, like everybody knows Shiplap uh, because if that was popular, right? Somebody made that popular. There were influencers that made that popular. And, uh, you know, I think that we might see, we might crack open the, 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 the door <laughs> to better lighting if we actually do kind of a populist media campaign. You know, let's get a whole bunch of manufacturers together and fund a television show, uh, you know, and just get people talking about light. Uh, and then when they go into the Home Depot and they see the display, they might say, oh, I want the shiplap version of the lighting, you know, whatever that is, whatever it becomes. But I don't think people are going to go in and really be inspired by a display anywhere. They're going to be inspired by, some, inspired by something they saw on TV. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I had in my 20 years ago, I had three shows on HDTV. So yeah, I understand the power of what you can do and how you can sell and all of that. The problem is that those individuals who are making the decision to have the shows on TV, they're not looking for older uh, pitch persons. They're not looking for the pitch persons that are not going to be super, you know, energetic or whatever, or speak about details. They're primarily looking for somebody to do bam, bam, bam. And I can tell you so many tales from behind the scenes of what you see on television is definitely not real. It is definitely not doable for the average person. And so it's definitely going to have to be an industry centered, industry focused, industry paid for campaign. And I agree. I agree. It's sorely needed, but we can't rely on the folks at HGTV or any discoveries or any of the other networks to, to come and talk about lighting intelligently. It's just not going to happen. I agree. It's got to be us, but it's yes. got to be on HGTV. Oh, yeah, it is. You know, it's going to be very expensive. It's, it's got to be this group. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, Chip and Joanna, Megan and Jim. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or, 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 or Jim and Deborah. Mm -hmm. Jim no, and what we need is Kim to... Kardashian as an influencer talking about it on Instagram, and then we'll have really <laughs> rapid fire adoption. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong generation. We have to get millennials and uh, yeah. we're, we're going to rely on the emerging professionals to help us here. And on that note, I want to thank our audience and I want to thank our panelists for a very healthy discussion. And we talked about doing it again next year. I think we should. Okay. Having I'm said, in. we are going to, uh, we will uh, post this next week and we will select some of the questions and we will post that as well. 
So from there, I wish you all a wonderful uh, afternoon and a great weekend, and we are signing out. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thanks for listening and watching. Thank you.